how are you? My name is Chris Quinlan and welcome to another episode of The Drum Show. And uh, what I'm doing today is uh, using my triggers to evoke orchestral percussion. Now, one of the things that happens a lot uh, in music is uh, percussion in classical music and we get pretty much out there. One of the main... Um, Oh, one of the things that uh, blew my skirt up years ago was uh, Edgar Varese's Ionization, which was a piece for 13 percussionists written in the 1920s. Brilliant stuff. Very polyrhythmic. Uh, amazing to listen to. Although, when you first listen to it, you think, what's going on? All that sort of stuff. But it certainly um, brought together a lot of the things that I was listening to at the time. Uh, the reason I got there, my uh, gateway drug was Frank Zappa and uh, a good teacher um, at school by the name of Brian Fitzgerald, now long passed on. He used to have a big band once upon a time. And um, what uh, what happened was uh, I just was just fascinated by the sounds. And then by the time I got to things like Emerson, Lake and Palmer's Brain Salad Surgery, 1973, same year, uh, Jethro Tull's Passion Play. I had no clue to what I was listening to, except that I just loved it. And one day I was going to understand it. And uh, really, a um, couple of decades on, here I am explaining it. So what happens is that when you look at this drum kit, there's my five piece in the middle of it all. Orchestral patches and all. Whatever. Um, but what I want to do tonight is actually give you a little bit of a uh, an in on some of the things that I do with uh, patches and things like that. Now I get quite melodic with my patches and um, with my triggers and everything. I don't bolster up the sound of my drum kit. I already love my drum kit. I was already love the sound of it. So what I do. is do different things. You know, things like that. So... Classical percussionist Vic Firth, who started off his own stick company eventually and stuff, was a big fan of uh, a, a piece of equipment, uh, a, a piece of equipment called a roto tom, roto toms, and stuff like that. Uh, I used to have a set of roto toms. The only drawback with them were great sounds, uh, but the only drawback was that the the sound spread a little bit too much. And uh, anyway, they were in fashion for a long time. I shouldn't knock them at all because I had two sets at one point. The melody, mel they could tune them to notes and things, twist them and change the note and the whole thing. These piccolo toms developed by Terry Bozio and DW Drums have the same kind of consistency in the sense that um, you can tune them to actual notes and things. And one of the things about classical percussion is you do get melodic with what you do. And um, what happens with this is I've got it tuned, I've got these half a dozen tuned to a Phrygian mode. on and then what I try and do with these is create fundamental tones hence the contrapuntal drumming and stuff like that that I do And the last episode I was talking about phasing. 
to Steve Reich. Now, what phasing is, is when you may be pulling something in unison. And then it phases out into single stroke roll. is really thinking more in terms of chords really and the percussion side with the triggers are really evoking yeah like a percussion ensemble one of the things I had to study in um, uh, my HSC before it became VCE year 12 if you like was music history and lit music history and literature and um, one of the things uh, that um, uh, I had to study was Bela Bartok's Music for Strings, Percussion and Celeste, which was a brilliant piece of music where you had all these different kinds of orchestral percussion sounds. But you've got to remember that um, the piano is a percussion instrument. So it was amazingly melodic okay, uh, for, for its time. Uh, or, or for that kind of uh, music sort of thing. It was quite out there and uh, quite chromatic. But um, Bartok was also a very famous musicologist where he would go into Europe and um, into the forests of Europe, in the, the rural areas of uh, Europe and um, actually uh, record and notate the folk melodies of various uh, people there, you know, Romanian and... Bulgarian and all this sort of stuff and, and the, he was Hungarian himself and um, one of the things about it is, is these folk melodies pervaded through his uh, music but yet he was quite percussive. You've got to remember that instruments um, that were uh, used um, by those, the, the folk musicians of, or European folk musicians of those various countries were things like the zither and things like that and uh, even Stravinsky have used similar instruments where they're stringed instruments, but you would hit them. You know, they were percussive. So you still had a melody, but they were percussive. And that's one of the things that's influenced me. So um, it's a bit of a scatterbrained approach for me to begin this show about orchestral percussion on a drum set, because you don't usually see a drum set set up in the middle of an orchestra, like the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra or something, unless they're playing Gershwin or something like that, or some kind of top of the, you know, some kind of Beatles or Star Wars kind of things that they do, more modern. But nevertheless, that's what I try and do. I sit behind a drum set, but I think in orchestral terms. And it's a bit highfalutin, but that's how things work with people like Terry Bozio, uh, a lot of people, uh, Grant Collins, um, uh, even Virgil Donati and David Jones. They think in terms of, they think differently, sort of thing. I don't want to put words in their mouth or, or verbalise them or whatever it is that you do, but you just think in different ways, okay? So a little bit more after the break. A um, bit of a long introduction. It's the whole first segment, but I hope you got something from some of the things I've been able to play for you, even just in snippets. More after the break. 